I think that's exactly what you so said. So this is, this, this is absolutely lovely. I wanted to point out a couple of what I consider VIPs. Um, the first is um, the best person I know in the world, um, my brother Lloyd Duplain. Oh. <laughs> Aside from being my first friend and in many ways my best friend, was a huge help on this book because a good chunk of it concerns our shared childhood. And as he read each chapter as I wrote them, he would send me voluminous emails, <laughs> mostly to the tune of, that's not how it happened. <laughs> so basically, this is his book. <laughs> and guess what? Zero royalty. We're not there. <laughs> So thank you for your help and thank you for being here. And the lovely woman next to him is his wife, Jill, thank whom you. I adore. Um, she is, she's a goddess. Jill gets um, applause and I don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> they were all terribly disappointed to find that you're married. <laughs> is Michael Michaud still here? Yes. Wave. Hello. Michael Gray Michaud, one of my favorite authors. He's a wonderful writer of Hollywood biographies. His most recent is Inventing Troy Donahue. Um, his, uh, I, I call it his uh, yeah, anchor store, is his bio of Salmanio, which is still the, the book about Salmanio. Um, and he's a really good writer and a really good person and actually had time to talk to me about ways in which I might uh, market this book, so you, you got to love that. Um, is Daniel Knox still here? Here. Knox! <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who have books, if you turn to the end, Mr. Knox took this photograph. Oh. And um, by way of living history, Mr. Knox also took my author's photo for Blackbird in 1986. Oh, wow. So, cry, I'm not gonna cry. I feel so blessed after so many, after the loss of so many friends, to have so many friends remaining. Um, to have history with so many of you. Jeff Patterson, whom I met in 1974 fell madly in lust with and went, dog on it, he's straight. <laughs> uh, and alas, still is. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> don't you dare tell Belle I said that. Because <laughs> she will. I'll tell her. <laughs> Perry Hart, who will in fact tattle on me to uh, Jeff's wife, um, has been my dear friend since 1976. He was my uh, musical director for my brief and abortive career as a nightclub singer. And he's a, he was fabulous. And he's a mm -hmm. wonderful, wonderful yeah. musician. Yeah, he was wonderful. And sitting next to him is <coughs> Teresa Terry Hayes, um, whom I adored for easily 35 years. Wonderful singer, dancer, actress. And I'm so glad we're all still breathing. And um, Okay, now I'm going to cry. Uh, I'm going to read a little sh little chunk from the book, and um, then my friend Chidu and I are going to uh, do what I have termed a couple of good-looking black gay guys sitting around talking um, for a few minutes uh, about the book, and then I'm going to do the Carol Burnett and see if any of y'all have anything you want to say. And that's what we're going to do now. So be as comfortable as you physically can be at this point. And, uh, Nobody seemed to be able to decide what, uh, is that a coaster? Right here. You can put it right here. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I asked several people what part of the book I should read, and there was no consensus. And because it is October, I decided I would read something out of the <clears throat> rather lengthy uh, Frankenstein portion of the book. <clears throat> and so that's, so that's what this is. Of the first three Frankenstein movies, I am by far most likely to pop The Bride into the media player. The original Frankenstein is arguably the best film as a film, but The Bride of Frankenstein is 
Well, it's just so darn gay. <laughs> <laughs> James Whale, the British-born director of Frankenstein and the Bride, was openly gay in 1930s Hollywood, mind you. He lived with producer David Lewis for over 20 years. Hoffnose, wild-haired Ernest Thesiger, who played the cray-cray Dr. Pretorius, was known to be bisexual. And Colin Clive, Henry Frankenstein, in both movies, is rumored to have been gay. And it's speculated that angst over his sexuality contributed to the chronic alcoholism that resulted in his death in, at 37. Rare among film directors, James Well is the subject of a biopic of sorts, Gods and Monsters, 1998, a fantasia on the last few days of Whale's life, written and directed by Bill Condon, who would later write and direct Dreamgirls, based upon the 1995 novel Father of Frankenstein by Christopher Bram, and starring Sir Ian McKellen as Whale. Novelist, screenwriter, director, and star are all out gay men. With only the flimsiest excuse for a plot, the creature didn't really die so the doctor makes him a wife, and 75 minutes to kill, <laughs> Whale padded the bride with cadenzas of sheer silliness. These would include every scene involving Una O'Connor as the Frankenstein family maid, a performance that had to have been played for deliberately for laughs. She looks like an ostrich on too much coffee. <laughs> Her over-the-top reaction to seeing the not-dead-after-all creature shot entirely in close-up is worthy of Todd Browning's freaks. Mm -hmm. And for a woman in a service career, she seems to have a good deal of spare time. She's everywhere. <laughs> at the ruins of the windmill where the monster died, but not really. Later yelling at the captured, but not really, creature through the barred window of the village jail. Surprisingly back on the job at the Frankenstein mansion, announcing old Dr. Pretorius. The ludicrous scene of Pretorius showing off his experiments, six inch tall living humans, grown by Pretorius and kept in bell jars to Henry Frankenstein is trick photography for its own sake. It's deliberately silly. The miniature Henry uh, VIII escapes his jar and tries to climb into the jar with the miniature Elizabeth I. <laughs> the scene kills a little time but makes for an uncomfortable plot point. If Pretorius can make entire tiny humans and a brain for the female creature from scratch, why don't the scientists work with Pretorius's methods to create the bride? Instead, Dwight Fry goes out and murders a girl to harvest her heart. <laughs> Whale and his two queer buddies, Claude Rains was Universal's choice for Pretorius, Whale insisted upon Bessemer, also seem to have peppered the bride with a little inside gay humor. Prior to bringing up Pretorius into the Frankenstein's parlor, Una O'Connor describes him as a queer looking gentleman. And <laughs> even allowing for the multiple meanings of the word queer, the mincing, lisping Thesiger seems a fit seems to fit a couple of definitions, and likely elicited some sniggering and elbow nudges among a subset of the audience. It has been argued that the blind hermit scene so brilliantly lampooned in Young Frankenstein is a queer-coded male couple. I say, mm, maybe. <laughs> but sometimes friendship between two men really is friendship. And before Gene Hackman ruined the scene for me forever, it was the most emotionally moving scene in the picture. For real camp appeal, take another look at the presentation of the bride, Elsa Lanchester, to the monster, Boris Karloff. Start with Bessiger's pritzy, prissy, curtsy-ish body language as he announces, the bride of Frankenstein. <laughs> <laughs> Check Lanchester's expertly painted face, drapey gauze couture costume, and towering two-tone coiffure, and consider that the doctors Frankenstein and Pretorius apparently did her hair and makeup <laughs> <laughs> and draped that gown. <laughs> the Frankenstein mythos wouldn't get this gay into the Rocky Harbor. <laughs> <laughs>